emotions and taste. Thank you. Um, yeah, so my name is Panos Mavros. Uh, I'm a second year PhD student at the Center for Advanced Spatial Analysis. And today I'll try to uh, convince you that we should be considering emotions uh, for, uh, in our uh, understanding of the city. Um, so in my uh, talk I'll do a quick overview of uh, the projects I'm involved in. So mobility can be quite fun sometimes, uh, as uh, with this gentleman uh, savoring a beer uh, in the middle of uh, Southwark. But most of the times it's a contradictory experience, negotiating crowds, negotiating traffic, noise, busy junctions. Um, so it, it, it's an experience full of contradictions. And um, we are happy to live in London, has thousands of uh, pedestrian streets which are marked in, in red here and you can only see the London appearing through the footways according to the um, OpenStreetMap uh, contributors. And I'm interested in particular in pedestrian mobility because when, as pedestrians, we're uh, the more exposed to the environment, uh, we're more exposed to noise and everything, and uh, also the quality of urban design is uh, a crucial part of our experience. And I think um, emotions are the key to understand uh, how we, we experience and move in the city, in, in, in cities. And um, in 1884, William James uh, famously said that uh, we see a bear, we feel frightened and run. And by this, uh, he meant that uh, our experience of the world could, could, wouldn't be the same if we couldn't feel. And also that feelings and emotions are a key component of behavior, our reaction times, our responses to, uh, to the stimuli around us. And and uh, when we consider the built environment, of course, uh, we don't usually see bears around us, but we have preferences and very subtle expressions of emotion and feeling uh, relevant to architectural styles, um, how the city looks, how the, the, the urban infrastructure is around us, if it's good or bad, or it accommodates our needs. So my, my case is that we need to consider to, uh, emotions to understand behavior. And we have uh, several models today, uh, 120 years after William James, uh, suggesting how emotions are uh, integrated in our uh, behavioral responses, providing information, co context, um, speedy response. So many times we don't uh, go back to our rational to uh, decide on something. We have an emotional response, uh, uh, short-circuiting behavior. And we can see uh, and we can study emotions either by asking people how they feel in a self-reported way or by using, for example, EEG and other methods of uh, brain imaging to, to, to see how brain activity is related with emotion. And um, you may like uh, be having your head uh, wrapped around uh, electrical wires, but uh, EEG has gone uh, much more mobile, friendly, and wireless in the recent years. And this allows us to study brain behavior uh, in uh, realistic conditions, and we are starting to explore that in the urban domain as well. So by looking on brain dynamics in different areas, doing some sort of spatial analysis on a very uh, s a small surface of the scalp, we can infer more or less what is the, um, uh, the, the, the emotional experience, the, the response of someone to certain stimulus. And of course these methods have been developed in the lab. So there are lab processes, you watch an images, you have a response, we measure the potential, and then we infer something. For the real world, we need to see if the, the same methods are uh, adequate, how we can adapt them. And we need new frameworks, we, new, we need new experiment des designs, we need tools to coordinate the experiments uh, as someone is walking around, for example. And of course we need analytical techniques uh, that are uh, strong enough to, to see through the noise that uh, natural uh, behavior introduces. But I think the important is to ask the questions now, and as technology moves, uh, we can move along and we can probably uh, give nudges to neuroscientists and electrical engineers and uh, who, who all the people involved in uh, promoting, let's say, science, and then we will, in the next year, see a surge of new methods and explorations. And this is exactly what we're doing uh, in a collaboration between CASA, my department, and the UCL uh, Institute of Behavioral Neuroscience, and the Hugo Spears lab, this is our team, and we're going to Soho uh, to study how navigation um, plays out in, in real world situations. And uh, Hugo Spears, a number of a few couple of years back, uh, they did an, an experiment with functional magnetic resonance imaging. So it means someone is lying down, getting into the scanner, having the brain scanners, they look uh, a video of uh, mobility m moving through Soho and making uh, spatial decisions. And we are trying to do the same thing, actually putting an EEG cap to someone and asking them to walk in the real environment and seeing how that actually 
uh, if it's the same process that happened, what different information we can get. And in my own research, I'm trying to, you, cannot, you can see it here, uh, this um, guy, this participant is wearing a, a, a emotive EEG scanner and he moves around. In my research, I'm trying to look on emotions in particular. So first, we need to look on EEG in general as a method in the city and then look how emotional responses may relate to places. And by plotting the, the readings we get from the device, we can start asking questions about how the environment might evoke, how might create affordances for a certain experience, and how cognitive issues play a big part as well, because we're not, of course, only emotional beings. So attention, um, uh, memory allocation, all of these play together. And a, a few months back, I was blindfolded, and then this um, really nice uh, bl a blonde dog uh, took me around. Uh, it's, it's a guide dog. So uh, Cassie guided my steps uh, for like 10 minutes and prevented me from walking straight in the bus lane and made me realize how uh, different users have different experiences of the city. And if this video played, which it isn't, uh, you would see how, uh, what, what it means to be visually impaired and partial sight in the city and how much uh, you can or you cannot see. And what we're trying to do in a project with the Future Cities Catapult and the Guide Dogs for the Blind Association is actually use the methods we're using in general sort of as a basic research to tackle a real question, which is what urban infrastructure provides or doesn't for a partially sighted and blind people. And for example, in this case, you see a, a very nice um, flat intersection, which is ideal, for example, if you're a wheelchair user or you're just having a stroll. But if you're blind or partially sighted, then you cannot see the, the, the absence of curb prevents you from having a tactile uh, connection to the environment. And um, to, uh, as a summary, uh, this is a map of London, and we have plenty of streets to walk through, or we can do all of them. But uh, I think we, we can start seeing how people respond to places, and how that leads to complex behavior, traffic, travel patterns, and how perhaps we can uh, design a better built environment that accommodates all our needs. Thank you.